All right, welcome to Alabama EMS Challenge. We got uh, two guest speakers today, Dr. Ben Foster, one of the senior residents at UAB, uh, coming out to talk about head and neck trauma, and then Dr. Vaughn is gonna be here uh, for the next hour to talk about psychiatric emergencies. Uh, of note, uh, the 24th EMS Challenge will be out at Springville. We're good to go? Good, it's Springville, nine to 11 lectures, and then Skills Lab, one to three, sponsored by the Alabama Fire College. If you're in the area, please come out. It's a great opportunity. Uh, tentatively, we have Survival Flight coming out as well, bringing the aircraft and helping with the skills labs from one to three. Uh, lunch will be provided, okay? Uh, just things to remember in the region. Remember for uh, uh, any system entry, STEMI, stroke, or trauma, please enter those uh, patients uh, from the scene before you head out so we know where we're going with that. If you have any issues with wall time, reach out and let me know. I think that is getting better. Uh, there's some new initiatives coming out with the UAB Ascension Alliance. Uh, we'll talk about that in the future. Uh, we'd like to welcome any of the ER staff nurses. We've put a, a big push to try to get emergency nurses uh, into our EMS challenge classes as well, even our skills labs, trying to rebuild some of those relationships we had in the years past. Also looking to move forward and getting some of the ER nurses from the local ERs in the Brims region riding with EMS again to kind of uh, see what you guys do. Uh, then maybe even having you guys spend some time in the ER if you're interested with those folks. So those are the updates coming up. If there are any questions or comments, always reach out to me and then we'll get started with Dr. Foster. We good, Chief? We're good. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, doke. Um, my name is Ben Foster. I'm one of the uh, PGY3s at UAB, and we'll be talking about head and neck trauma today. Um, so, just I have no disclosures, unfortunately, um, and we'll be learning about trauma <laughs> of the head and neck as we talked about earlier. Uh, we'll be going over blunt trauma uh, of the head and penetrating trauma of the head in addition to the neck, um, cover strangulation specifically. Um, and then we'll be touching on some topics that come from uh, the secondary effects of those traumas, such as increased cranial pressure, seizures, important pre-hospital measures that we can do um, before we get to the trauma bay, and then kind of immediate. I'm sorry, is your mic on? That's a good question. I do have a green light. Green. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's going for five stars. <laughs> Please like it's a crap. All right, we'll try with that. Okay. So start from start from square one. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> not really. <laughs> the good thing is I'm not that far. Take it with that. Yeah. All right. Take two. Um. So can we hear? I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Ben Foster. I'm one of the PGY3s at UAB going over uh, head and neck trauma. Love some good trauma. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, I'm a poor UAB resident and uh, we'll be talking about trauma to the head and neck. Um, specifically going over penetrating and blunt injuries to the head and neck and then the secondary effects that cause um, or that they cause such as increased cranial pressure seizures, important pre-hospital measures that we can do at the bedside to uh, try to treat these things, and then what their immediate uh, resuscitation that happens once we get them into the trauma bay. Um, we're not going to cover peds, uh, eye, or dental. Um, so I like to start most of uh, the things that I get lectures on from my attendings and uh, started doing it myself with uh, some patients. So these are based on real patients that we've seen in the trauma bay in the past uh, six months. So the first one is a 16 year old male who um, paged out as a level one found hanging in his garage, unfortunately, after his girlfriend had called his mom saying that she had sent him some vague uh, suicidal messages. Um, the good thing was that he didn't look like he'd been there very long. He was still warm. Um, however, he uh, was not. He was basically GCS three, um, barely breathing, had a pulse. Um, I guess he was GCS5 actually. Uh, <laughs> en route to UAV, he actually started seizing. Um, so we're going to go over specifically 
what what the the fire department did bringing him in and then what we did once we got him to the trauma bay but just as we go through these slides kind of think of this patient in your mind think about what you'd want to do um, as far as things to check things to do while uh, we're trying to stabilize him and then there's actually a second patient we'll talk about too who's a little sicker um, this is a 25 year old female who was a level one pedestrian versus car um, coming from the Avondale area, she had just ate lunch actually, and she was crossing that little crosswalk to back, go back to her car and unfortunately got hit by a car. Um, so she was GCS3, multiple obvious open bony injuries that were bleeding pretty significantly. Um, she had a pulse, she was breathing, but completely unresponsive. Um, she is a little more of a complicated patient, so think about things that you'd want to do. Do you want to do her airway now? Do you want to do you want to transport her first then let us try to do the airway in the trauma bay? Um, just kind of we'll, we'll we'll see what the fire department did and what happened. So uh, anytime we talk about trauma to an area we have to go over what specifically that area is entailing anatomy wise. So you have a skull that houses the important organ, your brain. Um, there are a bunch of different bones. There are a bunch of different bones that can fracture. Um, but the important thing is, so the skull's here and you have a couple different lanes of covering underneath it before you actually reach the brain matter itself. Um, so it's skull, this thick kind of tough uh, membranous layer called a dura. And then underneath that you have the softer layers. Um, and then it's just important to know this because in between all these layers is just where blood can go. So you have different kinds of brain bleeds that we'll go over later. Um, and just really the key difference is where that blood is. Uh, and that's just based on where it is in between the layers. So traumatic brain injury, um, blunt trauma, uh, misspelled blunt. <laughs> um, so primary things you can get, there's really three main things. So you can get trauma to the brain that causes bleeding. So you can get epidurals, subdurals, intraparenchymal hemorrhages, intraventricular hemorrhages, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And that's pretty much it. Um, uh, you can get contusions to the brain, which are not as serious, um, more commonly known as concussions. And then you can get this thing called diffuse axonal injury. Um, and so this is something that you actually can't see on a CT. You usually can't see it on MRI. Sometimes you can. And so our brain is just a bunch of neurons. It's these really small, very fine cells here that are easily damaged. And they have these long connections to other neurons. Um, and basically these long connections here, you just stretch them or you damage them and it disrupts the connections between them causing diffuse axonal injury, which is, that's the axon. Um, so those are the primary injuries that you can get from the brain. A lot of the injuries that you get in the brain actually come as the secondary effects of the blood that's forming in the brain. So as the brain itself swells from an injury um, or you start to have a collection of blood from an injury, you get increased cranial pressure. So your skull sits on your head and there's really nowhere for the pressure to go. Um, you have increased cranial pressure. It can't really drain. The only thing it connects to is your spine. Um, so you get increased cranial pressure. That starts to compress the tissue inside the brain. It starts to raise the pressure. And that's important because our blood flow has to oppose the pressure in our head to be able to give blood to our brain. Um, so this, you'll have your primary injury and then you'll have your secondary injury. And really, we can't do anything about most of the primary injuries. Neurosurgery can do some stuff about these things, but we can do some things to try to prevent the secondary injuries um, from the swelling. So what we were talking about earlier, these are our kinds of brain bleeds that we can get. So epidural, this just means we're below the skull, just above that really thick matter. So epidural, neurosurgery can drain that. Subdural, you're below the skull, below the really thick matter, and then above the fine lacy matter. Neurosurgery can drain that too. Subarachnoid is just a step below that one, and if intracerebral or intraventricular means it's actually inside the brain there. Um, usually neurosurgery can't drain those. So there are several different kinds of brain bleeds as we were talking about, but ultimately the treatment's all the same. Um, we treat them as operative until neurosurgery tells us otherwise. Um, so the most important thing for someone who has potentially a, uh, a lesion such as that is um, time to decompression. Um, so just treat everyone as if they can possibly be decompressed. Neurosurgery can basically drill a hole in there uh, 
evacuate the blood and that'll decrease the pressure in the brain, potentially stabilizing them. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of patients aren't surgical candidates based on where it is or based on them already being brain dead, unfortunately. Um, but I might let neurosurgery make those uh, treatments. One of the things you'll often see us do in the trauma bay is we'll call for something called TXA. Um, UAB does this on anyone who has a GCS less than three that comes in with a traumatic brain injury. And that's actually based on, there was a study called um, CRASH-3 that had almost 13,000 patients. Um, well, I skipped that early. The, basically, it showed that TXA has really, really minimal side effects and it can, it's a pro-clotting medicine that can try to clot off that bleeding inside your brain. Um, so it's in vogue right now until the next trial comes out and says it isn't in vogue. <laughs> Uh, so one of the most important things that we always want to know is, are you on a blood thinner? Um, and I think this is this is honestly the like the number one question we ask them when they come in, or we end up asking our, our EMS um, friends is, are they on a blood thinner? Did the family mention anything about being on a blood thinner? Um, honestly, we wanted all their medical history, but like honestly, are you on a blood thinner? Do you take a beta blocker? And then I'm like, all right, everything else is just kind of background chatter for me. I want to know if you're on a beta blocker because being on a beta blocker, especially with trauma, we expect your heart rate to go up. A lot of our trauma scales about how injured you are, they, they are measures of how high your heart rate is, is as one of the, the key numbers there in the equation. So if you're on a beta blocker, you're obviously not going to have a higher heart rate, even if you're really injured. Um, and we can reverse blood thinners. That's why we care about them so much. So this is just going over uh, what we were talking about earlier. So increased intracranial pressure is one of the key things that causes brain death and causes herniation. Um, so we were talking earlier, skull is completely encased. So when the pressure in increases, it'll push brain tissue down below one of the membranes in the brain. There's a bunch of di different membranes that it can push brain tissue around or below causing brain death. Um, but the key is that this is all driven by how much pressure you have inside the skull. Also, our blood pressure has to be higher than the pressure inside our head or else no blood pressure can go into the brain. Um, so one of the key things with head injuries is that you don't want them to be hypotensive at all. You don't want them to be hypotensive, you don't want them to be hypoxic or hypoglycemic. Any of those three things and you're starting to have cell death. Um, and then these are some medicines that we'll, we'll talk about. So non-pharmacological tips and tricks. I often find the best medicines aren't medicines. <laughs> They're positions and things that you do while you're getting set up to do procedures, et cetera. So elevating the head up 30 degrees, which so this lady is a good way to increase your intracranial pressure if you want to know what that feels like. Um, so put the head of all the stretchers up at 30 degrees and anyone who's had an injury to the head uh, keep the head in a neutral position. And in, most of these patients are going to have to have C-collars and just try not to have it so tight that it's compressing the blood flow coming out of the neck because that will increase your intracranial pressure as well. Um, and then there's some steps you can take while you intubate these patients and there's some drugs you can pick while you intubate these patients that'll try to have them have a better outcome. So a hypotensive patient is losing brain cells by the moment, or at least a brain injured one. Um, most of these patients, the first thing you start with is fluids. Use normal saline. LR is slightly, slightly hypotonic. And one of the therapies that we'll use is actually hypertonic. So fluid that has a higher concentration of stuff in it to try to draw pressure out of the brain. Um, and then basically the reason we're talking about why blood pressure is so important is because the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the pressure perfusing your brain, it involves how high your blood pressure is minus how high your intracranial pressure is. So you have to keep their systolic over 90 and really you have to keep their MAP over 80. So usually it's the MAP one that gets you. Um, phenylephrine is normally our first line medicine that we use immediately in the trauma bay if we think that they're having um, hypotension and it's related to uh, their brain, but uh, it can actually cause bradycardia, which if you're having Cushing's, which we'll talk about later, um, bradycardia can be worsened. So, hey, Dr. Foster. Yeah. So we did have a question come in. So talking about putting the patient's head up at a 30 degree angle for head trauma. Yeah. So that's different than stroke. So because we're told to blame some pine during stroke. 
So um, is, there a, is there a change in, in blood pressure when you raise your head as well as our cerebral perfusion pressure? What's the net cerebral perfusion pressure by raising your head? I guess is way to frame the question. Well, so the basic idea is that whenever you're completely flat, um, if you raise it up, you're you're just going to have being completely flat or head down. Gravity draws more blood and uh, decreases the drainage of the CSF from the brain. So hypothetically, the pressure inside the skull goes up. When you have the head up, gravity just helps you a little bit by decreasing the pressure. That's all it is. Um, so hyperventilating. So one of the kind of myths out there about head trauma is that you can bag them really fast and that that'll prevent them from herniating. Um, so that's hyperventilation isn't helpful with a very small star caveat. So studies have shown if you can hyperventilate them between 35 to 40 uh, your PCO2 for up to 30 minutes, then you are helping the patient. But if you get it below 30, if your CO2, if you bag them fast enough, because as you bag patients, their CO2 goes down. Um, so if you bag them too fast and the CO2 goes down too much, you're actually going to cause constriction um, of the blood vessels in the brain. So you can hypothetically, if you think they're herniating right in front of you, bag them slightly faster. But it, with the caveat, if you do it too much and they come in with a really, really um, low CO2, you're actually causing constriction. So intubating patients with head trauma. Um, so there used to be some thoughts that you would have to give all these patients lidocaine, and especially in the pediatric world, they still do and think this a lot, but the studies haven't shown that there's really a benefit from it. Um, hypothetically, you can give uh, fentanyl to try to blunt the, what you're trying to blunt is the sympathetic surge that comes with shoving a blade down someone's mouth. So. They think that giving people fentanyl could hypothetically decrease the response to that. Um, you can use it if you want. But really, the things that are important on this slide are when you're inducing someone with head trauma, you pretty much only want to use atomidate or ketamine. And the reason you want to do that is because these are the most hemodynamically stable of the induction medicines. Because what we were talking about earlier is you don't want to drop their blood pressure. And things like propofol especially are going to drop their blood pressure. Um, Hypothetically, benzos would also be a very reasonable um, thing to intubate with. Um, ketamine used to, they're, they're, the mantra used to be that if you give someone ketamine, you're going to raise their intracranial pressure. And that's because ketamine actually causes release of catecholamines. But um, there's been some several trials, especially out of the military, that show that that isn't the case and that you don't have worse outcomes with ketamine. <laughs> um, and then paralytic. So if the patient is GCS3 doing completely nothing, you really don't need a paralytic. If they're not breathing, um, you're not going to have any movement um, affecting your your view. But if they are breathing, then you know, use the paralytic. Or if they're moving, use the paralytic. Um, things like succinylcholine. So the, the two main differences when you give someone a paralytic, so you have things that cause you to fasciculate or kind of you know mildly shake, and things that don't. And rock is one of the non-depolarizing paralytics. And sux is a depolarizing paralytic, so really you you want to avoid sux because it will raise your intracranial pressure as your whole body just uh, fasciculates. Um, you have to keep in mind that rock is going to mask any seizure activity, and that the neurosurgeon is going to be uh, basically upset that you gave them rock. But hypothetically, it is the best for the patient, so we can reverse rock. So I, if I'm going to intubate a head injury, I just get a good GCS and then I just give rock and I just make sure that I've really nailed down like their GCS was three. They weren't moving anything um, that should be good enough for them uh, to, to know like based and then based on the CT, the scan that they get. Um, there are drugs that we give in the trauma bay to reduce intracranial pressure. So it's pretty much mannitol and uh, hypertonic saline. Um, 3% normal saline has been shown to be better than mannitol um, based on some pretty good studies that we have. Um, these both work by decreasing blood viscosity, so it leads to uh, basically auto-regulatory changes in the brain, which allow better blood flow in the brain. Um, so we're trying to keep perfusing our, our brain cells. <laughs> 
One thing to keep in mind if you give mannitol is that mannitol is always going to cause your patient to get hypotensive 30 minutes after you give it. So you're going to have to give them some sort of fluids after you give them mannitol. Dr. Foster, on the hypertonic uh, saline, yeah. so is that just drawing um, blood into circulation, fluid in, back into circulation? Yeah, their mechanism there? it works by two mechanisms. It works exactly by that mechanism where it draws fluid out of um, basically the swollen tissues into the blood, so decreased pressure that way, but then also it does this um, this second mechanism where it decreases uh, blood viscosity. So the way I think of it is, is that things flow smoother and it decreases uh, swelling by drawing out fluid. Is there any um, down the road consequences for the hypertonic saline? Does it um, cause any kind of creation of different cells or anything that you're aware of? That's a really good question. I think, I think all of these medicines will have some small side effects. If you give a ton of 3% saline, then you'll cause them to be really, um, really salty. So their sodium will go up really high and that will have some bad consequences. Um, but in general, what you can do in the short term to prevent their brain from dying can be later uh, treated by the ICU. So once the, if you give them, we don't give like four or five boluses of this stuff. We really only give one down in the emergency department and then we start them on a, a drip. Okay, we got one more question that's come in. Is increased ICP treatment, HOB, up still commensurate uh, with CDA in keeping the head midline to facilitate cerebral drainage? And uh, they, they added, most likely this is natural due to C-spine consideration in relation to the mechanism of injury. Yeah, um, um, I think if, I, if I'm understanding it right, are they, they're saying basically do they want to do the same thing in strokes for this as they do for the trauma? I think that's correct. Yeah, I that's what I would do. I would probably have to like look into it more to like give you a 100% correct answer, but it would make sense in mechanism. I think that the, the head of bed at 30 degrees is not going to be a major player for the most part. From my from my experience, it's more of an airway management. I don't want somebody laying flat that is kind of altered because of risk of aspiration. Uh, so I'm not convinced that that is strong enough that we say 30 degrees, 45 degrees, or flat makes a super big difference. Um, the current guidelines are about 30 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah, that's just a little confusing because the yeah. stroke protocol kind of insists that we wait patients supine. I agree, I agree. I'm, I'm always scared about aspiration issues. That seems to trump any difference you're making in, in pressures, but right. yeah. I, I don't know. Because, I mean, it, it doesn't affect blood pressure perfusion to the point of like changing the blood pressure with medications or other things would do. So I, I would not be too concerned about that. So the final answer is don't get too hung up on the hit flat or hit up or any of that. That would be my answer for that, yes. Okay. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. Uh -huh. One stroke case where we would elevate the head of the bed and their stroke symptoms would get worse. So, if you see somebody obviously that for whatever has more profound defects with their head higher, by all means, bring it down to help increase perfusion. Yes. But sure. outside of that, there's not any, there's again one case out of and then hundreds of thousands of stroke symptoms. Your circle that would be true as well. If you have somebody laid flat because of stroke symptoms, but they're choking the they're choking on their vomit. Yeah, you're going to so, die from an airway problem way before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so in general, seizure control is critical. Um, we have to stop all seizures by 20 minutes of onset. Um, once you get past that, then the oxygen reserves of the cells in the brain uh, start to decline and you start to have reversible injury. Um, so the, the, the general flow is that when someone first starts having a seizure, the first thing that you do is just watch them for a minute because the majority of seizures are going to stop within a minute or two. Um, but then anything longer than that, you need to give them benzos. And then if they're still seizing five minutes after your first dose of benzos, you need to get it, be getting a second dose of benzos. Um, and don't be afraid of giving, you know, higher doses of benzos than what I think we're used to. Um, technically, there is a study 
all of the, these dosings are based on a study from the Veterans Affairs in the uh, 1998. And so the dose is, is actually fairly high. Um, so like up to five milligrams of lorazepam in kids and seven, or sorry, five in, uh, of lorazepam in kids and seven of midazolam um, and adults um, up to eight and 10. So giving like two of Versed, um, it's really it's really more like give them like four, give them five so at least uh, to try to stop that seizure. Two is kind of over underdosing it. Um, and then in the ER, things that we think of when they're coming in, they've already had a first dose of benzos by our um, rescue providers. We have to give them the anti-epileptics earlier. Um, so we need to give them either Keppra, Phenytoin, or Phosphenytoin. And there's some studies that say that any three of these are fine. And I personally like Keppra because uh, it's newer and has fewer side effects. In general, the anyone who has a seizure that lasts longer than five minutes or has two or more seizures when they don't come back to their gross baseline is in status epilepticus. Um, so that is when you start to have the brain injury. So other practical things. So if someone, if you can, if they're having a seizure, you don't force something in their mouth or hold them down, but if you can turn them a little bit on their side to try to uh, keep their airway, like Dr. Ferguson was saying earlier, keep their airway, keep vomit um, and froth kind of coming out on the side. Um, that's ideal. This is the molecule that is glucose. So uh, anyone having a seizure, anyone who's altered, we need to just remember to check a glucose. And I have had this bite me personally. I had an altered person come in who was having a hard time breathing and their CO2 was really high. And I for sure thought it was either COVID or a PE or something like that. Uh, it turns out their glucose was 14. And when I gave them glucose, they started breathing better. Um, so position, glucose, benzos, and then time the seizure. So in general, look at your clock and say, all right, this started at 9.32. So if this doesn't stop by 9.33 or 9.34, I'm gonna be giving my first dose of benzos. Um, and I'm gonna remember that this started at 9.30. So I can say this went longer than five minutes. This was less than 20 minutes, et cetera. Um, so one of the really interesting, important things that um, helps us to communicate really is the Glasgow Coma Scale. So it was obviously developed in Glasgow, uh, and it's based on your eyes, your what you're saying, and what you can do. Um, so eyes, verbal, motor, four, five, six is how I remember it. And everyone knows the classic GCS less than eight intubate. Um, I'd say one key caveat on that is GCS less than eight intubate, if not improving, because um, a lot of these patients will have, especially like seizure patients that aren't a traumatic thing, um, will have a seizure, their GCS will be three, and it'll rapidly get better. Um, so GCS less than eight with not clinical quick improvement or with GCS higher than eight with rapid decline, um, we need to intubate. And this is just kind of something that it's honestly helpful to just have on a card. Um, a lot of the times I have to like specifically look it up for the motor response because I'll forget, is this a four? Is this a three? So um, there's some studies that basically say like the same provider will give the, the same presentation like a GCS of one or two points different. Um, but the key is more or less doing all the appropriate things or looking bad. Um, Cushing's triad, so uh, this is a general from World War I. He was the head of John Hopkins. Uh, he was a general, or maybe he was a colonel, I don't know. Uh, but Cushing's triad is when you have increased intracranial pressure in your brain you start to get really high blood pressure. So your body is trying to have your blood pressure high enough to oppose um, that intracranial pressure. And then as it does that, it actually starts to push on some of the, uh, the respiratory centers, et cetera, in the brain. So you get high blood pressure, which then leads to your pulse gets slow and your respirations get slow. Um, so this was something that the, the second patient, the, the female pedestrian versus car, um, I have more slides on that later, but her, she actually had, was having a real Cushing's response when she came in. Her blood pressure from the first slide was like 170 over 60. Her respirations were like five or six. Uh, signs of impending doom, so posturing. So these are the different two different main kinds of posturing. So you have decorticate where you're the C's and you're curled up forming C's with your arm. And then you have the decerebrate. So you're extending. Decerebrate has multiple E's in it. 
Um, and these are both signs of impending badness in the brain. Um, these are signs that you're starting to herniate things. So we have, like we were saying earlier, the different membranes inside the skull that whenever you have too much pressure, it starts to push your brain tissue um, through these membranes. And this would obviously be like a GSW to the head, like the brain's coming out of the skull. Other signs of badness, impending doom, if your pupils are dilated and fixed, uneven, or pinpoint and non-reactive. Uh, just a word on concussions. So concussions are just mild traumatic brain injuries. Um, you can have various signs and symptoms of them, but it's usually some sort of headache, fatigue, um, that kind of thing. GCS should not be less than 14, shouldn't be like more than just a little confused. Uh, and then the reason we have to have our like favorite fantasy players like leave the field is because if you keep having the repeated trauma, it leads to worsening metabolic injury. So the cells are contused, they leak um, some flu or some, the things that are supposed to be inside the cells and that aggravates the cells around them. So you really just have to have some time, supportive care and you'll get better on your own. This is the overall flow of what we want to think. So this is what we just went over. So in general, we get our GCS. We say how severe, how bad does this traumatic brain injury look? Um, so early, we want to look if GCS is less than eight, we want to think about airway management and protecting that airway. We also want to make sure that they're not hypoxic because the more hypoxic, the longer you're hypoxic with a brain injury, you're losing uh, brain cells. Also going to make sure we keep our systolic over 90, MAP over 80, use normal saline to resuscitate them, and then reach for vasopressors. It'll usually be uh, phenylephrine, but if they're already bradycardic, then we'll have to do something like Levo. Um, if we think that they're having or concern for herniation, we'll use mannitol or 3%. We can very briefly increase the rate that we bag them, but we can't do it for more than 30 minutes. And if we do it too fast and drop their CO2, it'll actually get worse. Uh, we'll make sure that we ask them if they're on any known blood thinners so that we can reverse them with the various products and commercial reversal agents that we have. And then ultimately, we just want to make sure we get them to neurosurgery as fast as possible if they're having a bleed inside the head. Hey, Dr. Foster, I've got some people texting me asking you to expand a little bit on concussions. So where the concussion interfaces with us, is when we're standing by for sporting events and oftentimes be a big hit or you know a volleyball player trips and bounces their head off the, the court and the coaches will ask does the play, does the player have a concussion a lot of the ems um, original education or initial education textbooks just define concussion as any blow to the head without structural damage to the brain um, so by that definition, any blow to the head then is a concussion. So would you say that they would need to have some symptomology to classify as a concussion? Or do you say just based on mechanism of injury? Or would you say, hey, I can't answer it. Yeah. I'm worried about it. They have a concussion. That, 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 is, that is the million dollar question. Because I mean, the NFL doesn't really know how to deal with this. So we don't really know how to deal with it either. Um, they're looking into like concussion scales. And I know the NFL, I don't know the name of it, but the NFL uses a specific concussion scale that involves like, I'm going to tell you two things and you're going to have to tell me those two things back after five minutes. And then they do a thorough neuro exam and then they have to ask the patient because a lot of it is um, basically what the patient's feeling. If they feel confused or have a headache or blurry vision, nauseous and those are obviously all signs of concussion you kind of have to have the person give you honest answers though um so i mean i think someone can can fake through have a concussion and fake their way into telling you that they don't so i think it's based on all how the patient's feeling and we don't really know um you know because you can have small head injuries without getting a real concussion yeah, I think from an EMS side, if you're working a, a sports game, but if, if you're working as as part of your uh, agency, or are you working as an independent contractor? Yeah, yeah. just gotta be careful. So I think if, if you're working a sideline game uh, for high school football and they ask you that question, the response should be, "That's a you no know, a medical diagnosis. If we're concerned at all, if you ask me this question, the kid probably should come out." If they're asking you guys that question, 
Um, and then they have the primary care, the coaches, uh, the, the team's doctor, or someone else make that diagnosis. Our goal should be, do they need to be seen by an ER physician? Is there something more than a concussion going on? So you get concerned for the big things. So the kid that was knocked out in the game, the kid who is now confused, or the kid with repetitive nausea and vomiting, that person should be evaluated. Uh, otherwise, I think they'll probably find out the game and get that diagnosis or not diagnosis of a concussion by the primary care. It is so, it's so hard to, depending on which group you look at, because even at the Tadega track, we have different ways to measure concussion. And some of it's medicine, some of it I don't really agree with as well. Yeah, it just puts us in a difficult spot. Right. Um, and so, it's something that occurs every football season. Right. It occurs in other sports as well. Yeah. What's a safe answer to get the monkey off our back and so the if, if they give us alone whenever Right. So, so the consequence is if we tell them the kid needs to come out, if it's a star player, you know how, how contentious that right. is. So I, I, would, I would answer that is if they ask you, do you think he has a concussion? I would say if you are concerned enough to ask him that question, the kid should come out and to be seen by somebody. And then your next question is, do you need to take them to the hospital or not? And that's when you make your assessment. If they ask you that question, I would, I would punt, uh, no pun intended, and say, if you were asking me, you're concerned enough, take him out for the rest of the game. Yeah, the other, the other logistical complication there is there's usually not a physician present. There's usually a physical therapy assistant that travels with the team. Right. And so, and they always have an opinion. Yeah, they, they do. And but that concussion can be diagnosed by the team's physician or the primary care physician the next day, as long as the kid does not need to be seen. Yeah, your job is just to make sure go to the hospital or not. Right. So, it, and your recommendation to them is if they're asking you that is out of the game. But you should not be making. That's not your decision to exactly. can they go back to play or do they need to sit out. Right. Your decision is do they need to go to the hospital or not. Do you see that there's a very big difference in what you're trying to answer right. and what they're yeah. asking you. But the people who need that decision made don't understand that that's our role. So that's something that's right. You got to explain. You explain that role to them. Like, look, yeah. my job here is to see if somebody needs to go to the hospital right now. Yeah. I, I believe that's why the um, the Alabama Athletic Association uh, concussions are defined as a headache after a contact. So you do, you automatically have to do the protocols regardless. That's the coach's responsibility. Exactly. That's coach's That's a different thing right. than whether they need to go to the hospital or right. not. Right. That's coach's yeah. not. So, um, I mean, you could say, you could, I mean, technically, if they just had to have an answer, you could say that. Yeah. I mean, right. sorry for the interruption. No, it's fine. Right. I, yeah, I'm sure that's frustrating. Uh, so now we'll start going over injuries to the neck. Uh, it's just a general overview of the neck. Um, specifically, important things that I like think about whenever I'm thinking about the neck is where is the cricothyroid membrane. Uh, so you have your Adam's apple there, that's your thyroid cartilage, and then you have just below that you'll have a, a cricoid cartilage, um, and in between those the cricothyroid membrane. Um, and then obviously you have the, the blood vessels run up the sides uh, together. Um, so this is one of the, the most exciting but also scary things that can happen coming to the emergency department. Uh, and I threw it in here because a lot of the times the, the neck and head injuries are when we actually have to crack people, uh, especially with these GSWs that come in. A lot of those self-inflected GSWs, there just isn't a lot of mouth left to intubate through. Um, so this is just a 45 second, I think, video um, to, to tell us about it. I don't know if you can hear it. No, they're not going to be able to Okay, I'll just talk. So right now, he's walking his finger down from the Adam's apple. Just beneath that, he felt the membrane. So he makes a small uh, two centimeter vertical incision down, expecting that it's going to start to get bloody. And then he immediately flips it. He shouldn't have taken his uh, hands off it, but flips it and then cuts down horizontally there and slides his finger in, um, passes a bougie until he feels resistance. And then he slides a either the trach uh, or crike specific tube or a 60 ET tube over the area, and he just goes down into heat resistance, and then he back, backs it up some. Um, you just put your in tidal CO2 monitor on it uh, and listen for breath sounds. So it's supposed to be a cut, cut finger bougie tube, and then this. So that's it with on a dead person. This is it on a living person. Um, so cut. He feels the, the membrane. He makes his 
sideways cut. He should have just kept his finger in that hole. He puts his bougie down through that hole, expecting lots of blood. And then you actually don't really need jelly or lubricant or anything because the blood will lubricate the, um, the tube that you slide over. Sometimes giving it a little twist. So I mean, that's that's all it is, right? Easy as that. Sounds good. Sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we can't do it. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Uh, and so this is a cervical spine. So um, you've got seven cervical vertebrae uh, starting at the base of the skull and working their way down. And then you've got your spinal cord that runs down the middle and the blood vessels that run down the sides. Um, and this isn't as important to know, but there are some several like really interesting like spinal injuries you can get, which cause very interesting. Uh, hey, I can feel on my left side and not my right, or I can feel my uppers and not my lowers, depending on what's injured. Um, you there are tons of different kinds of spinal fractures you can get, but ultimately knowing them isn't as important as knowing that what the treatment for them is. And almost all of these is just immobilization and have surgery uh, fix it for you. <laughs> it's my favorite. I just call neurosurgery. Hey, got a spinal fracture. Uh, this is just a picture that shows a lot of the different interesting spinal pathologies that you can get. Um, so obviously you can be just paraplegic, quadriplegic. Um, you can actually also get, you know, depending on what, so this is the, the picture is the spinal cord. Uh, depending on what part of the spinal cord is injured, you can lose feeling, temperature, or motor either on half your body or and not the other half. Uh, or just in the upper and just in the lower. So they love to test this on all of my tests, but I don't think it's as important for pre-hospital. Uh, so strangulation specifically, um, there is a specific fracture called a hangman's fracture that was based on where the knot was uh, hung. Uh, but a lot of these people actually have, uh, they die a lot of the times just from suffocation or from uh, jugular and arterial compression of the um, structures getting the brain. They get hypoxic, uh, then they get bradycardic, and then they die. Uh, so anyone that, like our gentleman who was hanging in the, the garage, if they've been there for a while, they should start to have facial bruising, petechiae, um, and then if they haven't been there for very long and they're still awake and you cut them down really quickly, you'll find that uh, if they're still able to talk to you, a lot of these patients are going to be hoarse or striderous, and if they are, then we need to really consider, hey, do I need to take this person's airway now? Because um, you're just going to have more swelling as time goes on. Uh, and then other things you can get. So obviously you get hypoxic, um, you, your heart rate goes down, you have a cardiac arrest. You'll have lung injury specifically because you uh, jump off the stool, you hang, and then you actually still try to breathe, uh, but there's no air coming through. And so you get this pulmonary uh, edema from your lungs trying to pull against a uh, closed circuit basically. Um, and then obviously if you uh, are there long enough to cause the spinal fracture that injures the spinal cord, you'll get all sorts of um, neurogenic things. Ultimately, the supportive care, ATLS uh, algorithm, and then closely watching the airway and securing it. Um, these are, there was a list of just like life-threatening things to look out for anytime you have uh, neck injury. Um, tracheal deviation, obvious wounds to the neck that go completely through it, um, like bruising around the neck uh, specifically is a bad sign. Um, laryngeal disruption, horse, striderus, that kind of thing. If your neck is crunchy and vizimitous when you push on it, it's another bad sign. Um, so specifically for, man, I wish I hadn't misspelled things in this lecture. Uh, so, <laughs> so specifically, you can have an injury, you can have an injury to the blood vessels of the neck. So you can have a spinal fracture that isn't that bad, but if the spine then pokes into the blood vessels that it's supposed to be protecting, that is a bad thing. Um, so you can injure one of the, like for example, the carotids or the vertebral arteries um, that run up in the back of your neck there. And you can have stroke-like symptoms or TIA-like symptoms, but it can be from a blood flow issue from an injury to the arteries feeding the brain. Um, from the ER perspective, there is a screening thing called the Denver screening criteria. It turns out it's not super great because it can mess up to 23% of injuries. So UAB has adopted everyone who comes into trauma gets a CTA of the neck. And that's why we re-CTA everyone. So y'all will bring us a transfer patient like, yeah, they got full CTs. And then we'll look through it and it won't have the CTA of the neck. 
uh, and then we'll reCT everyone because um, they want to get it. Uh, in pediatrics, there was there's not as much data, and there was one small study that said that it's a lot less likely to happen in kids. So children's doesn't CT everyone's neck. I don't know if that's because of the study or not, or just because of their personal opinion. Um, so whiplash, uh, this is the Alexander. I like to, I think Better Call Saul reminds me of a familiar face in Alabama that I'm not going to mention uh, that I respect really greatly if he's watching. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> so it's a sudden acceleration deceleration injury uh, that causes some muscle and tendon injury in the neck. Uh, it's not life threatening. You get pain, stiffness, cervical, uh, just like some not bony tenderness, some paraspinal tenderness. Um, there are some screening mechanisms that you can use to uh, not CT these patients, but a lot of times patients are going to ham it up really good. So most of the times we CT them unless we can use the screening mechanisms to avoid it. Uh, and these patients always want a soft collar to go home with, but studies say that if you give them that, that they're going to have pain for longer periods of time, uh, but they'll look a lot more injured and it'll help their court case. Uh, this, pl the platysma, this is a muscle in the neck that whenever you have someone like strain or bear down basically, like you're seeing it on this gentleman, that's that muscle that pops out. Um, that is important because when you have penetrating neck injuries, it's defined by an injury that goes through that muscle that comes out that you can see whenever you like strain your neck. Um, so in general, any wound that violates that is just is a five alarm fire needs to be explored in the operating room. Never probe uh, in the trauma bay. We even have to remind ourselves because we want to like get in there and look around, but we're not supposed to probe wound injuries that violate the platysma. Um, they're supposed to go to the OR and get explored. Um, for penetrating neck injury, um, a lot of times they can miss esophageal injuries on CT scans that then come back and bite us in the ICU. Um, obviously, GSWs are really bad. Um, there are different zones of the neck. This is uh, more important for us whenever we're trying to figure out what could be hypothetically injured, um, uh, different things that run in them. Uh, really the, the key things for this, like for everything, is airway, breathing, circulation. So um, in general, like intubating these patients is very tricky um, and it should be done hypothetically by the most experienced person possible. Um, and we should be ready to do the crack in the trauma bay if we need to. Uh, obviously looking for strider, if they're having massive hemoptysis, they need to be intubated. Um, if they have a lot of sub-Q sub air throughout the neck, that's another sign that they likely need to be intubated, and then expanding hematomas. Um, we want to bag the patients, but keeping in mind that uh, we could hypothetically throw more air into the soft tissue, but you know, keep, you have to keep them, keep their oxygen above all uh, in a normal range, so don't worry too much about it. Do what you have to. Um, yeah. Are hard and soft signs of uh, neck injury. And if you have any of the hard signs, um, really it's just hold pressure slash tampon audit, uh, secure the airway, and then they need to go directly to the OR for surgical evaluation. So bubbling wounds, expanding pulsatile hematomas, active arterial bleeding, um, major hematemesis or hemoptysis, uh, neurodeficits, unequal pulses, all of those things need to go straight to the OR and there's other soft signs. Hey Dr. Foster, yes. so um, initial EMT training they always talk about lacerations of the neck have to be covered with an occlusive dressing to prevent air embolism. I've never really understood the physics of that nor been very concerned with it. What's your what's your thoughts on occlusive dressings like uh, uh, air proof gas proof dressings on neck wounds? I think it's a good idea to put a dressing on it, but I don't think you're going to get an air embolus really. I don't, I mean, maybe hypothetically, but I don't really see how that would work. I think it's more of like if it, if you're losing air through that and you just occlude it so that air can go down the right hole until we can get a secured airway. Yeah. And the key thing he said too, remember, is if there's a wound there in the neck, don't explore it, right? So if it's not bleeding, don't go poking your fingers in there and do anything with it. If it's bleeding, pulsating, then you got to get your hands on it, combat goggles, hit, what you got to do. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't poke neck wounds to make it worse. Um, so do I need a collar 
in the real world, practically, it's almost yeah, always yes, except for penetrating injuries. Um, so if you don't have a focal neuro deficit uh, for a penetrating injury, then you don't need a uh, collar. And then our studies actually say that we'll miss injuries if we put collars on like people who get stabbed in the neck, but they're not having any focal deficits because um, then we'll, there'll be a second stab that we don't see. Uh, and then just putting on a collar, um, hypothetically, it's a two person job. This is the technically the position statement on who needs a collar. So um, the reason why we end up putting collars on everyone is because almost everyone is drunk or has some sort of weird complaint that could be neurological, like they're saying that their hands are tingly or they're feeling a little numb um, or something like that, or they have an obvious distracting injury or they're intoxicated. Um, so there are technical guidelines on who needs it, who doesn't, and just in general, all blunt traumas, I put a collar on. Um, we're going to put it on in the bay until we can prove that they the CT doesn't have a cervical injury. Um, and then something interesting that I found uh, that apparently conventional extraction techniques uh, move the spine more than if you just put a sp uh, spinal collar on the person and then tell them to get themselves out of the car. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. So uh, two last quick things before we wrap up on and talk about those last patient encounters. So neurogenic shock, shock versus spinal shock. So neurogenic shock is a true shock. Neurogenic shock is your hypotensive, your bradycardic, um, but you have warm extremities. And I just got to stress initially that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So every person who has trauma is bleeding if they're hypotensive until proven otherwise. Uh, they're bleeding in their stomach or somewhere else or it's on the scene. Um, but this is once we say, OK, they're, they're not bleeding anywhere. Why are they hypotensive? We move to could this be neurogenic shock with trauma to the head and neck or spine? Um, so you really shouldn't see this with low back injuries. You have to have it be fairly high up in in, in the uh, nervous system to have neurogenic shock. And the way this works basically is the brain can no longer tell the blood vessels to constrict. So you, your brain messages are cut off from the rest of your body. So your brain is saying constrict blood vessels to increase my blood pressure and they just can't do it anymore because the, the neurons are cut. Um, the treatment for this is just, it's good uh, ABCs. You support them with fluids, you start them on pressors, um, you keep their map uh, a little bit higher than you would expect. Phenylephrine is the initial um, vasopressor of choice, but it can cause bradycardia. So phenylephrine and less bradycardic, and if bradycardic, then levo. Uh, atropine is good. If they're bradycardic, they will usually respond to that as well. Spinal shock. So spinal shock is not a I'm hypotensive and I'm dying state. Spinal shock is a my spine has been injured and it might get better state. Um, so this is a transient stunning of the cord where you lose some sort of function and we hope it comes back basically. And if it comes back, we say, oh great, it was just spinal shock um, and uh, you improved and uh, usually these lesions will, will get better within a couple weeks. It's, it's from swelling basically. Okay, so just wrapping up. So the 16 year old guy, so he was hanging in his garage, uh, looked warm. He was barely breathing, but he was breathing. He had a pulse. GCS is like five um, and in rally started seething. So like, what do we want to do? Do we want to do the airway now? Do we want to do it later? Um, so when they ended up doing, or what we really want to do is control airway, control seizures, head up, positioning. Check a glucose, because anyone seizing, anyone altered, we got to make sure that they're not doing it from a reversible cause. And then we manage their intracranial pressure. So what happened with him? So he seized once in route, it's self-aborted, but within that one to two minute, by the time they were drawn up with the, the benzos, it had stopped basically. So they brought him in. It was a really quick transport, so they just bagged him. Uh, he seized again whenever I was intubating him. And he actually started posturing, which was a really bad sign. Um, we gave him all of the things to prevent seizures. We gave him the benzos, Keppra. We put him on propofol for his sedation. Uh, and then we gave him the 3% because we didn't know if he could have had some sort of other intracranial injury or not. Um, looking back, we probably didn't need that. His CTs actually didn't show any obvious injury, which is great. He got admitted to the TDI. And he actually got extubated the I think the next day he just had this remarkable recovery 
Um, he ended up having very minor focal neuro deficits that um, were were more of like difficulty walking, but he he could talk, he could walk, he could move all of his arms and legs. So he had a really great outcome, and I think it was because of um, how short of a time he had been there, basically, and how fast he got to the trauma bay. That's a really good case for a lot of reasons. We, I don't know if it's the same case. We had a case similar to that here uh, a couple of years ago um, with our crews. But I think one of the important takeaways there is just don't assume that somebody who's on themselves is going to have a really bad outcome. That there are there are occasions where they recover. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, had to see a psychiatrist. Um, so uh, the second case, a little sadder. So this is our 25-year-old female, um, little fairly obese, uh, unfortunately, which complicated things. So on scene, high blood pressure, low respiratory rate. Um, so she was starting to have Cushing's, um, actually. She had multiple open, pretty significant bleeding uh, injuries from her uh, MVC or being run over. Um, so what did they do? What should we do? Um, so they actually elected because it only happened right at uh, Avondale. They threw tourniquets on. Uh, she wasn't hypoxic, so they just bagged her en route to the trauma bay, um, which was turned out to be the right idea because this intubation ended up being a nightmare. Um, so she arrived with very similar vital signs. She, this was a day, so we alternate who intubates uh, us or anesthesia, depending on what day it is. So this is an anesthesia day. So, you know, hypothetically, the most experienced airway people in the hospital. The first attempt, we push drugs and she vomits, just massive vomit. She'd literally just left lunch. Uh, second attempt, they're going, they can't see, the suction's clogged. They think they can see bubbles. They try to thread a bougie. They go for it, ends up in the esophagus. The third attempt, the SATs are now in the 50s. The heart rate is climbed to the 140s. There's still tons of vomit in the airway. Trauma surgery starts to crack her. She is very obese. The crack takes a lot longer than expected. Her heart rate actually starts to drop. Uh, SATs are in the 40s before the crack is successful. Um, we normalize her vital signs. We very quickly get her to CT. She has a massive epidural. Um, she has a lot of other significant injuries, but brain takes priority. Um, she obviously, like while we were doing all of this, we gave her 3%, we gave her uh, benzos because she seized, we gave her Keppra. Um, we were doing all the things to try to decrease her intracranial pressure. Um, neurosurgery successfully decompresses her epidural. The MRI later though shows that she has massive um, diffuse axonal injury. Uh, trauma surgery takes her, does her X-lap. Unfortunately, she never um, gets over a GCS3 and her family decides to uh, palliative extubate her and uh, donate her organs later that week. So, uh, can't win them all, but we can try. These are all my references. That is it. Um, not in the chat, but I have one. I, I know um, we get back on the trauma outcome reports a lot, um, the DAI diagnosis. So, just explain to everybody what that means. If you, if right, you. yeah. So, um, DI, DAI. So, inside the brain, we're, we're made up, our whole brain is made of neurons, basically. And they have the, the structure of neurons is really interesting. So, um, so th this is a neuron, basically. And they have these long connections to other neurons. And so diffuse axonal injury. So this is an axon. And so it's basically just your head gets jostled uh, so much that it injures the connections of the neurons to other connections. Um, and some of that's from the initial injury. And some of that is from the, the things that leak out of the brain cells when they're damaged. Uh, and then they cause swelling and just uh, enzymatic injury to other neurons. Um, so DI, DAI is basically we don't see an obvious injury, but the cells are microscopically damaged. And if we were to like take a slide of that and put it under a microscope, you would see that the cells are breaking down and injured. So would you say that, uh, generally speaking, the prognosis for that is very poor? Yeah. Yes, very poor. Yeah. 
So it's underlying brain injury, like an epidural hematoma or a subdural hematoma. It's blood pushing on the brain, causing the brain to get compressed, to get swelling, and get problems. DAI is the brain tissue itself is killed from the initial injury. So it's, it's that will never recover. So not good. Okay. I want to touch on a few points. Um, three things uh, that kill people with head injuries that uh, Dr. Foster mentioned, hypoxia, hypercapnia, or hypocapnia, and then hypotension. So uh, hypoxia, head injured patients need high flow O2, they need early airway management if able. Hypoxia kills brain cells. He also mentioned that hyperventilation is not good. So if you're using waveform capnography in the tube, or if you use a nasal waveform capnography, you don't want that entitled CO2 less than 30. Entitles less than 30 cause brain cells to die, and that's a bad thing. Um, and then hypotension, low blood pressure with head injury is bad. We talked about permissive hypotension in the past with penetrating trauma. All the studies that look at that exclude head injuries. So we can fix ruptured spleens. We can fix a jacked up pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. We can't save the brain. So hypotension is bad in head injuries. They should have, did y'all uh, get that link put in the chat box yet? No, if not, well, I'll put a link in the chat box. It's for uh, the EPIC studies. It's got some good publications there you can look at that talk about head injuries. Uh, one of the big things I do in our view critical care stuff from flight programs is looking at post intubated people. What is their entitled CO2? Because less than 30 is really, really bad. People can die from that. Uh, so watch that. Um, we mentioned C collars. C collars are kind of meh. They're probably going to be going away in the near future, sort of like backboards. There's some good study that shows you put a C collar on somebody, it increases intracranial pressure too if it's too tight. So we still use them now, but the point is be aware that they're not the end all be all. Okay, do a good exam before you put them on the field. He mentioned TXA. TXA is okay for head injuries. We like TXA for trauma as well. The hypertonic saline that you mentioned, we can actually make that in the field. You already have it. It's sodium bicarb. Sodium bicarb is eight and a half percent. So that's twice as concentrated as what we use in the hospital. I'm not saying push bicarb on your head injuries. I'm just saying that's an available option for weird circumstances. Um, and then we talked about uh, RSI intubating people. And I know that some people out there are thinking, well, can we do dirty RSI and just use our ketamine now? And I would answer no to that question because like this case you mentioned right here, um, there's some airways that are complicated and making someone not breathe doesn't take all, way, all the risk away. So if you give someone a big dose of ketamine, they quit breathing, they can still vomit, they can still actively aspirate. It's better if you're going to do RSIs that you take your agency and you apply for the advanced practice so you can do paralytics and a sedative and you get training. So no dirty RSI. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, skills lab. Uh, so in the cadaver lab in the past, we've done surgical airways. We'll do that again when I can open it up to UAB. I will be bring pick traits to all the skill labs we're doing. We do that at Foley, we'll do it at Springfield, so you can kind of practice what it feels like to do crites and things like that. But even if you have the tactical paramedic patch that uh, says the state says now you can do surgical airways, you should not be doing surgical airways on people until you've been checked off by your medical director and you have actual training. So just because you have that tactical medic patch now, the state says you can do them, doesn't mean you do them until you get training. And that's all I got. Thanks for smiling. So if the patient says no when you ask them if they want a surgical airway, you probably should do the surgical airway. That is correct. Okay, that's what I got out of it. Thanks. Yeah, still, yeah. <laughs> you do not restrain them to their neck. That is no progress. So what do you think about that? Thank you, Dr. Foster. It's a great lecture. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Dr. Burson. We're going to take a few minutes break. Everybody, everybody get up and stretch your legs. Remember to fill out an attendance form, please. There's a link in the chat box. Uh, if you can't get to the chat box the way you're uh, watching, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply with a link to the form. The password for today's, uh, for the form for today is site. P-S-Y-C-H. <laughs> I had to look at somebody to make sure I'm spelling it right because I can't even spell that right. Um, so that's the password. Please remember, everybody found for me. If you don't need the con ed, we appreciate the feedback. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. Good video. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're going to get...
started back with Dr. Vaughn. I'm not foolish enough to attempt the pronunciation of his last name. I'll let him uh, tell us that so we don't butcher it up too bad, but we're really happy he's here. He's going to be talking today about psychiatric emergencies, and uh, thanks for being here, Doc. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Benjamin Vaughn Schwann, some of the assistant professors of emergency medicine at UAB. Um, so really at Mar, my interest is in uh, trauma and uh, resuscitation and uh, tactical medicine. But anyways, uh, but today I'm going to be talking to you about psychiatric emergencies um, and we're going to go over the basics. Basically, we're going to talk about feelings all day. So I'm sure you, everybody's real excited about that. We're going to get everybody's feelings out and we're going to kind of go through that. So, yeah, <laughs> this is about how you feel. So anyways, um, so we're going to go over the this. There's not really a, in the in the guidelines, there's not really like a psychiatric emergency um, guideline. So we're going to go, basically review the ultimate status protocol. How does psychiatric emergencies fit into that? We'll go over some drugs and then we'll just go over some theoretical causes, cases that uh, we've had. So uh, first off, so this is the uh, the 2020 uh, alter mental status protocol. I know it's kind of small to read, but anyways, so um, looking at this, uh, this is kind of the things you want to get when you come on scene, you know. The person that you called me about, because usually when you're doing it with a psychiatric emergency, it's not the patient themselves that calls, right? It's always somebody else that calls. And so the thing is, is like, who called and why did you call and what was going on? Do you know this person? Do you not know this person? Were you just like the guy driving down the road? You saw somebody else. He was acting kind of weird. Um, or is that, you know, so get try to get as much information as you can from a bystander about what you saw, what was going on, because you are now our eyes and ears for what's happening. Most of the time, these guys don't have reliable even names. You know, they're coming as John Doe's a lot of times because they won't tell you or they're everybody's named Jesus. I don't know. But so there, and there's not that many of them out there. So always make sure you can get as much bystander information as possible. Um, and then what was the what was the environment like? You know, was there a bunch of scattered bottles? If there were pill bottles, try to bring those in, like try to just bag them up, bring them in with you so we can kind of do like some forensic kind of investigation on that. Uh, to figure out what was, unless it's a crime scene, obviously, and that, that's different, that's handled. But if it's not a crime scene kind of issue, bring in all those pills and stuff like that so we can kind of start doing some um, um, Sherlock Holmes kind of stuff and figure out what this person took and why is this person acting the way they are. Um, you know, mental status when you see them, and then were there any changes by the time you see them and bring them to the hospital? Those are all kind of keys and going on. I don't recommend you smell the patient's breath. That that I, I know it's on there, but let's just just it's just not worth it. Not worth it for you. Not worth it for them. So don't, stop trying to smell. Stop trying to smell breaths. Uh, it's kind of like some older kind of dogma. Um, so um, if you see multiple people with the same psychiatric complaint, they all don't have the same psychiatric condition, and then you got to start worrying about poisoning, especially carbon monoxide, some other things. Um, so that should uh, increase your spidey senses a little bit if you see lots of people with the same thing. Uh, the most of the time these people are going to succumb is from an airway problem. So always, you know, make sure, you know, ABCs are managing A as far as this goes. Um, and again, all psychiatric patients are medical patients until medical or trauma patients until proven otherwise. Okay, what that means is you just don't go, okay, this person's just crazy because they're crazy. We always have to think medical, rule out all the medical, rule out all the trauma causes, and then say, all right, fine, this is a pure psychiatric related condition. So those are kind of the pitfalls and going down these psychiatric emergencies is just going straight, oh, this just must be schizophrenia or this just must be depression. Um, always got to make sure the medical causes are ruled out first and then we can kind of dive in and say, okay, what primary psychiatric conditions are we going to be dealing with today? So uh, the treatment. Excuse me. In this, um, if you're concerned about poisonings or carbon monoxide, um, lots of oxygen, get them to the hospital. Um, consider IV, and that's uh, most of our psychiatric patients. Um, I try to actually consider it as in probably don't do it. All right, you don't want to try to be putting in an IV in somebody that's kind of flailing around or something like that. It's just not worth you sticking yourself, you sticking your partner sticking the paint multiple times and, and they pull, they just, you do all this great work to get it in, they just rip it right back out, right? So you just wasted a bunch of time, didn't really get anything accomplished. So most of the stuff we can do that we need to do to keep the patient safe and keep you guys safe can all be done 
IM, intranasally, things like that. So um, IV would be for like the unconscious attendant psychiatric patient. Again, outside the hyperadrenergic psychiatric patient, I would avoid IV if all possible. So um, obviously if you consider like an opiate in addition to all of this, uh, naloxone is gonna be a great drug for you. Again, this is probably somebody, um, try not to aggravate the situation as best you can. So if the patient does better in a dark room, like with less noise, try to provide that as best you can. Um, restraints, we'll go over too. Consider restraints as necessary. Again, the restraint is the patient on their back with their arms and legs tied independently. It is no longer tied hands and tied feet together. Okay, so always different four point kind of restraints. If you, Sometimes you can get away with just two. That's always better than four if you can. If you have to do four, always separate points, never and always on their back, never on their face. Um, and we'll talk about some drugs here in a little bit, but we had you know, access to Haldol, uh, Benadryl, Ketamine, and um, we have our benzodiazepines at the bottom there as well. So um, again, all this can be given intranasally, IM, IV, if you have a patient that's cooperative enough to give an IV, but if you have a patient that's cooperative enough for an IV, they probably don't need any of these other medications in general. So uh, think of it that way as well. All right, so kind of the first one we're gonna talk about is Haldol. Uh, you know, it's kind of one of the first, what was classified as like these first generation antipsychotic medications, just meaning they're older. Uh, it comes in oral, IV, IM, and long acting. So, so somebody actually might already be on, you might not know this, but somebody actually might already be on long acting depo Haldol because they either show a history of non-compliance, it's court ordered or different things like that. Uh, they already might be on this. Uh, it's mechanism action, it's, it's typically, it just blocks dopamine. Most of our acute psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, they have a surplus of dopamine. And so what this goes in does is blocks a lot of that dopamine um, and therefore it kind of has a resolution of those acute psychiatric symptoms. Um, with that, uh, on the flip side of that is the condition, if anybody knows the condition where you have a lack of dopamine is Parkinson's disease. So you can contrast a lot of your psychiatric conditions with somebody with a with bad Parkinson's disease. So those are kind of like almost the opposites of the medical spectrum when it comes to mechanism of action and what you see. So a typical Parkinson's patient with a Parkinson's crisis, they can't move, they can't walk, they can't talk because they don't have any dopamine in their neurons to formulate uh, connections and cause muscle contraction and cause um, things to work. On the other hand, when you have way too much dopamine, you work too well, you're talking too fast, your muscles are moving too much, you're very adrenergic, you're very uh, geared up, for lack of a better term. So again, so the goal is we're trying to block some of those uh, dopamine receptors. Um, so again, we use it in, so Haldol is kind of used in psychosis. We also, you also see it used in chemotherapy, see it used to treat nausea and vomiting. We use it in the ICU sometimes for patients that have been on the ventilator for a while that had their sleep-wake cycles kind of mixed up. They'll be awake at night and sleep during the daytime and that leads to more disorientation. We can kind of use that for that as well. You'll see patients with Tourette syndrome also being used this drug uh, to help with the side effects of that. But at the same time, when we're gonna give this drug, we gotta know some of the side effects of this. And the one that we have to be most careful about are these um, expyramidal syndromes or EPS, and I'll get into that in a minute. You'll see some patients that have been on a first generation or even second generation psychotic for a long time. They can develop what's called tardive dyskinesia. We'll get into that a little bit more. Um, they also can get elevated levels of prolactin, which is another uh, hormone uh, that causes weight gain, breast development, lactation, um, which the, the, due to its blocking of dopamine receptors. Uh, NMS or neuroleptic malign malignant syndrome is kind of one of those psychiatric emergencies we have to be aware of and not just say this person is just kind of acting crazy because they'll die um, if that's the case. And then the, the dreaded one down here is this QTC prolongation with Haldol. So again, patient that's probably already on some medicines that prolong their QTC um, and you give them additional Haldol, you can send their QTC so prolonged that you send them in tor to torsades. Um, and so something we have to be careful about. Another one uh, uh, in, our, in our medicines out there is uh, Benadryl diphenhydramine. Again, it's a first generation antihistamine. It comes in a multiple different types of routes. Uh, basically, it blocks histamine and blocks um, acetylcholine. Originally, we kind of looked at it for allergic reactions. In the psychiatric tone, we're kind of using it to prevent this EPS or dystonic reaction. Um, 
And what that does is because of how when you start blocking dopamine with Haldol and some of the other antipsychotic medicines, uh, what it typically can do is cause um, an un, for lack of a better term, an uneasiness feeling in the patient, or they can start to develop some like upper facial kind of contractions and grimacing, um, and this just feeling of agitation, uh, although they can't really move because they're you've blocked some of the dopamine, but now they get this kind of uneasiness feeling, and that's easily treated with Benadryl. So a lot of times you see us give Benadryl and Haldol together. Um, one, I'm using the Benadryl um, to help with some of these dystonic reactions. Um, I'm also using it as far as it's, because it also has some sedating properties in it too, because I have this very keyed up individual and I'm trying to basically calm them down enough to be able to have them not hurt themselves or hurt somebody else. Um, some of the, uh, you know, adverse reactions of this, you know, I actually want the sedation, uh, but you can also get like dry mucus membrane, you can get increase in confusion with elevation, ele increasing doses of Benadryl. So a little bit on those uh, EPS syndromes, so you'll see this person, they kind of like have this characteristic, they'll start contracting a lot of their facial muscles. You'll see them kind of grimacing, grinding their teeth, doing this number. Um, you can actually be called to the scene for somebody like this. Hey, they're just, face isn't moving right, and it's usually, um, uh, it can be part of that uh, EPS thing. Um, and basically the treatment for this would be uh, be Benadryl diphenhydramine and kind of helps um, stop and reverse some of those symptoms. This one right here uh, is kind of just to scare you guys at night when you go to bed. Um, now this is a patient with uh, tardive dyskinesia. So um, somebody that's been on Haldol or one of these first generation antipsychotics for a very long time or somebody that's been on lithium, um, what they can do is not that they're making faces at you, but they can develop a syndrome called tardive dyskinesia, which is where they get these uh, involuntary, mainly facial tongue uh, muscle contractions. Um, they kind of occur. And the unfortunate thing about this is if you recognize it early, um, like, hey, they've been on it for a couple weeks or and they start developing these symptoms, you stop the drug, these symptoms get better. Sometimes, however, the symptoms go unnoticed or they're not severe enough to get medical attention for. And once this kind of progresses a little bit, even if you stop the drug, these, no, these never go away. So you might see a patient doing that. It's kind of this involuntary facial muscle twitching. Um, and it's unfortunately it's irreversible at that point. We can do like some botulism and some other kind of therapies to maybe help uh, decrease muscle tone. But in general, once somebody's been on this for a while, that that that's that's an irreversible thing. Again, we don't see it as well. This is kind of was way more common in the 80s than it is today with some of the newer generation antipsychotics. They they don't really see this as much. So. Um, last on the medication list, um, lorazepam, uh, midazolam, uh, again, benzodiazepines, you can give them oral IV, IM. They're going to bind to your GABA receptors, increase GABA flowing through those receptors in the brain. GABA is kind of like the pump the brakes receptor in the brain. It kind of calms all the other neurons down when you have increasing GABA. So that's kind of why we use it. Again, seizure, too much, all these kind of things are when we're using this treatment, there's too much other neurotransmitters going on, too much serotonin, too much norepinephrine, um, too much dopamine. And what GABA does is kind of blocks, it's kind of a feedback mechanism to block a lot of those. So we use it for seizures, agitation, people that have taken too much uh, methamphetamines, ice, too much cocaine or um, crack. Uh, they can, this is a great kind of treatment for those. Um, we also use it for sedation. And the other thing is for alcohol withdrawal. So somebody that has been on alcohol for a long periods of time, um, they alcohol promotes GABA release. And then when you kind of pull that away from the patient, pull alcohol away, um, they all of a sudden become GABA, they become dependent on that. And once they get out, once they have no more GABA to pump the brakes on the rest of their neurotransmitters, you have norepinephrine, serotonin, things like that will start to go way up and they'll start to get very um, adrenergic, they'll get hypertensive, tachycardic, febrile, confused, seize. And so that's where adding back some sort of Ativan or benzodiazepine helps with the side effects of those. Obviously, it comes with its own risk of problems, right? So people that can OD on these benzos just as easily, um, think of it that way. So you can have respiratory depression, you get hypotension, just of how the, just how well it relaxes, um, not only centrally in the brain, but peripherally on the uh, vasculature as well. So 
Um, so it's always this balancing, especially on these psychiatric patients, there's a lot of concomitant drug use as well. And so what you'll see happen is um, a psychiatric patient will sell, usually self-treat with some, with some sort of street drug. They don't usually get great mental health. And so they'll self-treat with either um, methamphetamines or cocaines, um, and they'll be very adrenergic at that point. And so you're trying to do this balancing act of, I want to give you enough this to kind of just calm you back down, but I don't want to overdo you and give you too much. And that's kind of like, and I wish I could tell you there's, we have all these MIGs per kg dosing on these medicines. The problem is it doesn't work well in people that overdose because, again, it's you're trying to find that right point of, Give them enough, but don't give them too much to tip them back over uh, the edge on that other side. And the other thing is the half-life, especially on midazolam, is way shorter than the half-life on some of these other street street drugs. And so what will happen is um, you'll give them some a little better, and then they'll rebound again. And you get something to get better, and they rebound again. When you flip over to just some of the long-acting benzodiazepines like uh, Valium or um, Librium, uh, what can happen is is that now you've tipped the balance and now you give them more benzodiazepine than they had of this other uh, adrenergic medication in their body and now they're going to be more respiratory depressed for a longer period of time because now you've overcome that and now you're going to deal with the complications of that for longer so um, when i tell people you're trying to you're trying to find the right balance of this you can always give more of your medicine it's hard to take that back away like once you give it you can't unring that bell, okay? So you can always give increasing doses. You can't pull that syringe and pull it back out of their system at that point. Now you just have to deal with those side effects. So always look, work on giving increasing doses versus uh, a big dose up front. Hey, Doc, do you have uh, Remazicon available in the ED for benzo overdose? So let's talk about remaz uh, flumazenil or Remazicon for benzodiazepine overdose. It's a great overdose. It's a great treatment for benzodiazepine overdoses. I would caution its use um, it is if everything else has failed, then I would go to that. So if you're just dealing with a little bit of hypotension or a little bit of hypoxia, I would treat that with oxygen therapy and fluids. I wouldn't reach to flumazenil, unless I'm dealing with pediatrics, I wouldn't reach to flumazenil or, or mazicon. The reason being is a lot of these, especially as you get into adulthood and all these Adults, they've probably been on a benzodiazepine for a long period of time. And when you give flumazenil, you give an, you basically give an irreversible cause to, do, to uh, the GABA receptors. And then if somebody's been on it, you just send them into acute benzodiazepine withdrawal immediately. Um, and so you're going to get all the side effects of that, the nausea, the vomiting, the tachycardia, the hypertension. And now I can no longer give you the treatment for that, which would be a benzodiazepine, like a uh, midazolam or lorazepam because I've blocked all those scepters with uh, flumazenil um, and that's irreversible. So now I'm basically stuck uh, with a patient that I can no longer fix the problem that I kind of potentially caused. Most of the time the side effects of hypotension and respiratory depression can be managed without acute reversal of those. So same thing kind of goes with naloxone. I'm going to finish, let me finish. So same thing kind of goes with naloxone too. So you see this, you'll see a lot of our psychiatric patients also kind of OD or take too much opiate medication. The goal with naloxone is not to bring them back awake to their former selves. The goal with these medications is just to get them breathing enough so that way they're you're trying to prevent the respiratory depression from that. You're not trying to get them to walk around again and be give you a thumbs up and a high five because I guarantee you they're not going to do that. <laughs> um, so the goal with these is just to give them enough to get their respiratory rate up to where they're not going to succumb from respiratory arrest. So that's kind of that again, it kind of goes back to that balancing act of giving them enough to overcome the serious complication of it, but not enough to where you send them into complete withdrawal. So and I wish I could tell you the exact dose for every patient, but it changes from the same patient on different days to different patients. It, there's no magic drug. It's just always, you can always give more. Once you meet that magic threshold and you just give them enough up front, you're going to not be liking life for a little while. So, so I guess what I'm thinking of, you have a, like you have a status patient that gets a big dose of first ed and gets snowed. Sure. So that, that generally seems to end in intubation rather than trying to reverse the first head. Correct. And I so, guess that would the danger be to precipitate the seizure activity again if you gave the 
Correct. So if the person that comes in with a seizure and I give them a big dose of, or I have to give them a bigger dose of, a bit, excuse me, a benzodiazepine to stop that seizure. Um, if now I give them a reversal agent for that big dose, I'm going to potentiate the seizure again. And now I've just lost one of my treatment drugs to treat that seizure now. So uh, the goal would then be just to support their airway either through intubation or just uh, jaw thrust or something like that. Sometimes you can either just jaw thrust them because remember the half-life of midazolam is pretty short. It's five minutes. So you can sometimes potentiate them through that um, to overcome the side effects uh, versus actually sending them back into their former status or something like that. So um, always just try to support the airway through it. Again, it, it'll be short, at least with midazolam, it'll be shorter lived. So I wouldn't uh, necessarily reach for a reversal agent. And again, not pediatrics is a little bit different. So you have a pediatric patient that got into mom's Xanax or something like that. That is a perfect indication to give flumazenil or something like that because you know the kid has no prior history of opiate dependency or benzodiazepine dependency. Otherwise, we have other issues to talk about. Um, so therefore, that's the perfect indication to give a kid with severe respiratory depression or something like that. That's you can see like somehow gotten to somebody else's medication supply, that would be somebody that I would reverse. Does that make sense? So, um, the last one um, is ketamine. Again, comes in a I, I, IV, IM, oral. Um, really, it's mechanism, it blocks uh, glutamate um, on these NDA receptors similar to LSD. I think ketamine, now yeah, we've tried to use it to treat everything at this point. <laughs> um, but uh, specifically, um, where I'm using it is for the agitation, uh, the, the severely agitated patient in the ER, or I'm using it in combination with um, RSI or some other indication. So um, again, the side effects of this one are a little bit different than some of the other drugs we just talked about. You can get more hypertension with this. I see this, that people don't kind of, it's like, oh, it's, it doesn't affect your respirations. Actually, if you push it too fast, it will. So if you just take that ketamine and you slam it home, IV, you're going to cause somebody to go into respiratory arrest uh, and not realize it. You push it slow, you're less likely to have the respiratory depression and you're more likely just to get the um, amnesia effects that you're hoping for. But if you push this fast, IV, you will see respiratory depression and respiratory arrest. Uh, the other thing you'll see a lot of this is you'll get some laryngospasm. You can, you'll see a lot of increased secretions with this. They just tend to salivate and they have a lot more bronchorrhea, so you're kind of going to have to suction them out more. They do have some increased ICP. It's transient. It's not clinically significant. Um, so again, as far as you know, side effects from that one. Um, and the protocol, it's I think it's four milligrams IM, one milligram IV per kg dosing. Uh, I tend to again, it's one of these medications you can always give more of. Once you give it, there's no reversal agent. So um, just be beware of that. And so I think. There's nothing wrong with giving a four meg per kg dose. I would just start, to be honest, I've given this drug a bunch. Um, you can probably get away with like a two meg per kg IM dose and just get the same get the same effects you want rather than just going to a big four meg per kg dosing. We actually don't have, and this has to be the concentrated version of ketamine um, because it comes in two different formulations. So if you're using the concentrated version, you can do this. If you don't have the concentrated version of ketamine, then you're, you can't give it IM because the dose is just, it, it's too big in the syringe. It's too big to go into the muscle, basically. So, nope. All right. Now that I've gone through all the slides, <clears throat> it's rapid. Yeah. <laughs> all right. There we go. I just want you all to stare at that picture a little bit longer. <laughs> Come on. I know, right? Great. Somebody can dress up like that for Halloween. That might have. There we go. Let's do this. One. All right, fine. All right. So now let's do some do some do some calls. So you have a patient with history of bipolar disorder. Uh, recent start on new medication. The call for you guys is ultramental status. So you get on scene. Uh, you notice that the muscles overall, the patient seems tense. They are confused. They're unable to be still, they're hypertensive, they're febrile, they're tachycardic, they kind of look like maybe they have an infection, they're confused, they're drooling. Um, so you kind of have all this, they're kind of just 
unable to be still. They're not too combative, though. They're just more altered than anything else. They're not swinging anybody. They're just kind of altered. Uh, this is one of these psychiatric emergencies, and this is uh, what I was going to get into is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So again, we don't see this as often anymore, but it's still out there. Um, it usually occurs within initially starting a new antipsychotic medication. Haldol is kind of the stereotypical one, but you can also see it with Geodon, some of the newer ones. They have very high fever. So you're like looking at somebody that feels warm to touch, like their fever is 103, 104. Uh, this is one of those things that they need uh, rapid supportive care, otherwise they're going to die on you. Okay, they're gonna go into bad rhabdo. They are um, not gonna do well. They need to be in an ICU. Uh, and they need to have good, what we call good supportive care. So what we have to do is we have to cool their body temperature. They're, they're not having a fever because they're infected. They're having a fever because they're having a side effect from these uh, medications. And so we'll, we'll initiate some sort of cooling mechanism on them um, to help bring down the temperature down. Lots of benzodiazepines. I wanna put these people into respiratory depression because I want to basically calm their body down as much as possible. Uh, and that usually involves, well, we usually wind up intubating these people when they when it does happen. Their muscles are, and the other reason is because their muscles get really stiff and they just get really contracted, almost like tetany kind of contracted. And what that'll do is that'll release a lot of um, myoglobin and it'll release a lot of uh, creatinine into the system. When that What that ends up doing is that all gets filtered by the kidney and end up going to kidney failure. So not only are they not drinking enough fluid, but they're febrile and they're they need more fluids, but now they're releasing a lot of toxins that are damaging to the kidneys and then they'll wind up going on dialysis for a while as well. So these are one of those people that, you know, um, if you see a patient with history of um, um, some sort of mental illness, they're on a antipsychotic medications and they feel warm to touch and their muscles seem tense and all that, this is one of those things, get them to the hospital, start cooling them pre-hospital, um, give them a dose of call, get a dose of benzodiazepines on board with them and get them get them in. This is not somebody that can just follow up. So uh, a little bit on bipolar disorder. Um, so just in general, so in general we classify bipolar is uh, mania kind of cycling into depression. Um, they usually have these episodes where they get very um, elated. Um, they can become uh, they have some of the same typical features of schizophrenia where they'll have grandiose ideas, although not to the degree of schizophrenia. They'll have very little need for sleep. They'll have some of the pressured speech, racing thoughts. Um, you can kind of convince them things that aren't there are really there. Um, they love to go shopping. They'll have like 15 boxes of Amazon at their front door a day. Um, they'll burn through all their money and then they'll cycle into these severe depression episodes where they'll just be... Uh, a kind of a, elusive and a recluse. They'll keep their doors closed, keep their lights off. You won't see them for days and they'll kind of cycle in and out of these. And that's kind of the typical definition of bipolar disorder. There's been a lot of variations on that, but that's kind of typically what you see with somebody that that it, that has this condition. So um, anyways, all right, next patient. Call, 57 year old male, thoughts of suicide. Um, so exam on him is pretty unremarkable, except he just seems flat doesn't give you much information, barely gives you his name, just really has no sort of effort uh, when, when you're kind of interviewing him, trying to get a history from him. You kind of get some history that he has a history of diabetes, he has a history of heart disease. Um, you notice this is where kind of, not only do you need to pass medical, you need to figure out what else is going on in life when you get these calls for these depressed patients that are saying they're suicidal. Like what else is happening? Because um, usually you can find out more of like, what was the straw that broke the camel's back per se, or what was the final thing that caused them to tip over into now wanting to kill themselves? And that's kind of the important part in the interview is what are it? You know, so this guy is divorced, lost his job, history of alcohol and tobacco abuse. Uh, he has a history, history of a sister with depression and suicide attempts, but he has none himself. So if you had to guess, is the patient low, medium, high risk for actually going on to commit suicide? High, right? So let's look at those features. So risk factors, um, kind of the extremes of age. So your adolescent uh, and your el as your elder and your older, they usually have more more classic cases for suicide. The people in the middle, not so much. Male has been typically associated with higher levels. Um, physical health problems. So somebody that just received a bad diagnosis of cancer, some sort of irreversible process, they are more likely to have this. Somebody that has mental illness is more likely. So these, and somebody that's isolated, 
unemployed, financial struggles, previous hit, attempt of suicide, and then family history of suicide are also playing the role of their own risk factors for suicide. Um, a little bit about depression, we think it's, um, when we look at different animal models and stuff like that of what is depression, like how do we diagnose it, how do we treat it, uh, when you look at, when you measure these um, chemicals in the brain, they have a decreased amount of norepinephrine, they have a decreased amount of serotonin. So a lot of our treatments are geared at elevating those levels within the brain to help kind of improve their function. So in general, for most of your psychiatric conditions, you need some sort of duration of symptoms. So an isolated day of feeling down and feeling sad does not equal depression. So when you have these periods for long, when you have those symptoms though over long periods of time, that's when you get depression. So, or that's when you can kind of diagnose depression at that point. And then it also it has to interfere with like their job or how they get along in life. So um, something that uh, kind of uh, kind of pertinent to this group, um, providers of especially pre-hospital guys that work in stressful environments, EMS being one of them, um, thoughts of suicide are, are higher than the general population. OK, so that's something where it's good to check your own mental health, check that of your partner, kind of, you know, in the, in the South, it's very much, you know, we always ask each other like, oh, how are you doing today? And we, the only answer I want to hear when I ask you how you're doing today is either good or just wave at me. I really don't have time to, so anyways, but when we, we seriously though, when we do talk to people, we want to get like, hey, how are you doing? If you notice somebody that's struggling or seems different or seem off, you are, I mean, in this profession, you are at a higher risk for bad things to happen to you. So take those take those signs and symptoms seriously from you or your partner and get help. OK, don't just think you're not as tough or you, you know, you just need to suck it up uh, because you, I mean, just based off data, you we're more likely to um, have thoughts of suicide and then actually be successful when we do uh, attempt suicide. So um, this is one of the groups. Um, this is a uh, buddy. Um, Oh uh, gosh, uh, buddy check, 911 buddy check. So it's kind of geared towards um, pre-hospital first responders. Um, they've got a lot of good resources uh, when it comes to mental health, um, how to check on you if you have a friend or somebody else you're worried about, different avenues of approach to get them to get them some help. So again, it, it's better to over triage these, meaning you say somebody needs assistance and they really didn't versus to under triage saying somebody didn't need assistance and they really did. There's no harm in over triaging these. So, all right, last one. So, a uh, 19 year old female uh, with vomiting. So, you get on scene, you have a patient who's bradycardic, hypotensive, they got poor dentition, they got calluses on their feature, on their fingers. They have this fine, like baby like hair on their extremities, uh, and they're very cachectic looking, right? So, this is classic for anorexia. Uh, which is kind of falls into the eating disorder category and under psychiatric emergencies. Not that this isn't this this didn't happen overnight, right? So uh, this is going on for long periods of time. But there are when you see these patients on scene, or by the time they get mental help or they get help, there's a lot of bad things that can happen that we need to be careful of. So one of the things is they just they're so nutritionally and volume depleted that their heart doesn't function well anymore. So they have. Uh, either a lack of glucose or a lack, lack of phosphate, a lack of magnesium. And so you can see like these um, either frequent PVCs or they can actually just develop just prolonged QT with this. Um, a lot of them can have dehydration that's so severe that they'll wind up in renal failure. They're vitamin deficient in almost everything. They're at a very high risk for, for, for like stepping in a hole and getting a fracture or things that wouldn't otherwise cause fractures. They're at a huge risk for fractures. Um, a lot of them that do um, uh, throw up or vomit a lot. They're at risk for tearing up their esophagus, for having esophageal tears, stomach tears. And then there's this um, syndrome when we do get to them called refeeding syndrome. And basically what that means is, so they've been so nutritionally dis deprived, we give them a bunch of food and they end up dying. And the real like, well, I thought I was trying to treat this. But what happens is, is that um, a lot of our, our the smallest energy molecule that we can break down is called ATP, and when we lose a bunch of that, we, we, we're left with ADP. Or uh, and when your body gets a lot of 
nutrients is like, okay, well, I'm going to regenerate a bunch of this ATP. What happens is that just further depletes phosphate levels. And once those phosphate levels reach a certain point, uh, it winds up in, you wind up um, having severe arrhythmias and dying. So this was kind of like the, uh, from the World War II, the concentration camps, like a lot of these people wound up dying very early on because they would just eat, like they've been, they've been so nutritionally starved, they just eat a bunch off the bat. And a lot of them just die within a couple of days of that. Uh, and that's the that thing that's really due to refeeding syndrome. Um, outside of all of that, um, if their weight loss is more than 25, kind of what we kind of think of, um, if your weight loss is more than 25% of what your expected weight should be based off height, that's one of the indications for involuntary admission at that point. Um, so that's all I have. Any questions? Anything on the chat? Uh, this is Russell Stein right here. These um, you get these calluses on the back. If you look at the back of their hands, I'll have a bunch of calluses where normal people shouldn't get calluses, and that's from uh, throwing up. So the um, the only thing that, that came up sure. was if we had somebody who was altered, who was extremely uh, malnourished, would D10 or D5 be appropriate? If they're hypoglycemic. I would, I would avoid it if they're not hypoglycemic. And the reason is because you can potentiate the refeeding syndrome by giving them too much glucose without repleting phosphate first. Excellent. Yep. The other thing I want to add is, you know, we've talked about ketamine, and I agree the two mg per kilo IM dose is probably appropriate. If you've seen me talk about ketamine use, I like using the, the weight based or height based, uh, ideal body weight. I do, yeah. And uh, that's on our YouTube channels. You can look that up. Uh, you're better off going low than high. Two mg per kilo of ketamine should chillax the most excited delirium patient you see. Okay. And remember, post ketamine patients are now critical care patients. So once you give ketamine, okay, once they relax enough for you to do an exam, you expose them, you check your glucose, you put them on the monitor, and you manage their airway. If they get hypoxic, they'll just get nasal cannula or high flow O2. They get airway management. They get hypoxic because they're not breathing well, right? So you give ketamine, they relax, you cut the clothes off, get an AccuCheck, put them on the monitor. If they're hypoxic, you reposition their airway, maybe do a, do a nasal trumpet. If that fixes them, great. If that doesn't fix them, then you get oxygen and you ventilate them. You cannot just put O2 on somebody post ketamine or post Versed because what happens is they're still not breathing well and your oxygen gives them a high sat for a good or 10, 15 minutes, and then they crash going to cardiac arrest. So remember, post-ketamine patients, you manage their airway for hypoxic. And I know I've said that several times in the past. So just in general from the dogs in the room, mm -hmm. how do y'all feel about people who are out of control, presumably have a, some type of a psychiatric emergency going on? Um, do you think it's better for the patient in the pre-hospital setting to use chemical restraints or physical restraints? So, so is it better for one? Or, so you never use one, or so it's always a better combination in both, right? So the, you know, if you're using one, you're so if you're using one without the other, that doesn't really make sense. It's always use both. Um, ideally, my go-to first line is chemical restraints, but it, and once those fail, I add in physical restraints after chemical restraints have failed or are in the process of working better. Because remember, with chemical restraints, with any of the medicines we just talked about. It takes these don't it's not like one five seconds you're going to get the result that you want. It takes a little bit of time. And so that's where your physical restraints come in until you have enough chemical restraints on board that you can now DC your chemical your physical restraints. So our goal is chemical restraints in a stepwise approach, right? For the agitated patient. Chemical restraints are a lot of times it's physical and chemical together. Chemical, chemical, I can release my physical restraints. That's the point I want to be at, okay? In terms of the stepwise progression in these um, agitated delirium patients. Okay. So, and remember, it's also a safety issue. So, if you're going to restrain somebody with ketamine, for example, and they finally calm down, and you had three cops and eight firemen on the scene, and now you got one medic in the back of the box with this guy that was kind of agitated and big, you're probably better off soft restraints, four point restraints. And that way, if he wakes up in route, you're not having to fight this guy right. with yourself. Yeah, that's true. Too. Just remember, again, I, I just can't stress enough, we're getting a lot better on the region, but 
If you sedate someone or chemically restrain them, you've got to manage the airway. It is poor form to give someone ketamine or set or something, and they go into respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest from an airway problem. That cannot that cannot happen. Just just from an operational point of view, you know, one thing that's kind of a hiccup is ketamine's category A for excited delirium. Uh, physical restraints are category B, but you can't really give the ketamine in that circumstance to do some kind of physical restraint. Right. And that's that's something that needs to be addressed at the state level, I think, as well. And that's why you also gotta have a good relationship with law enforcement. So, you know, those guys should kind of help you restrain the patient physically while you give your ketamine yeah, you're doing and, then, and then everybody else backs away. Okay. Now that I'm not saying that we give ketamine to people that are handcuffed times four in the back of a police car. That's not right either. But we should work with law enforcement to safely manage these patients so no one gets hurt, including the patient. Great. I think that does it for all the questions. Uh, thanks, Doc, for a great lecture. Yes, Good subject, great lecture. Thanks, Dr. Foster and Dr. Ferguson for being here. We're going to wrap it up for today. Everybody, please remember to fill out an attendance form. If you didn't click the link in the chat box or couldn't get to it, you can send an email to alabamaemsjohns.gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply with a link to the form. Please fill it out even if you don't need the credit. The password for today's class is psych, P-S-Y-C-H. I think, I hope I spelled that right. Did I spell that right? Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's right. <laughs> it's all lowercase too, by the way. Yeah, lowercase. That's correct. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you. Uh, we'll be at Springville next time. See you then. See you in Springville.